Hey, Working Preachers, we want to extend a huge thank you to all of you who generously responded to the 2024 spring campaign. If this was your first gift to Working Preacher, thank you. If this was your 15th or 30th gift, thank you. And if you give monthly as a sustainer, we thank you. Thanks to your generosity, we met our ambitious $75,000 goal, and you unlocked a $10,000 matching gift. All of you are amazing, and we appreciate your support. Thank you. We know you rely on Working Preacher, and we are grateful that you took the time to let us know what this ministry is worth to you. So thank you for keeping Working Preacher working for you. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. This is the podcast for the fifth Sunday after Pentecost, which falls on June 23rd, 2024. And our readings are Job 38, 1 through 11. And then we have our um, semi-continuous reading, which is 1 Samuel 17, 57 through 18, 5, and then 10 through 16. But if you are also looking for the 1 Samuel 17, basically the whole chapter commentary on David and Goliath, you'll have to look that up because this commentary is, this uh, podcast is for the, uh, the second alternate reading that hopefully makes sense to all of you listeners. The alternate alternate. The alternate right. alternate, yes. Psalm 107, 1 through 3, and then 23 through 32. Second Corinthians 6, 1 through 3. And our gospel reading is Mark 4, 35 to 41. The stilling of the storm in the gospel of Mark. And so... Which we wind mm-hmm. up taking the fishermen back to the water. <laughs> I noted before that we had all of these uh, seed stories and planting stories and healing stories. And um, Mark takes uh, the fishermen back to the water just for a bit here. Back to the water. Yeah. And I uh, was, we had the festival of homiletics a couple of months ago, and my opening sermon was on the Matthew version of the stilling of the storm, which is never in the lectionary. Neither is Luke's. Uh, we only hear from Mark, uh, and so I think I would suggest the first step for a, uh, a preacher is to compare the versions and to see what the differences are and to recognize in particular what what's going on with Mark's version and his uh, his line to the disciples, have you still no faith? Matthew's is you have little faith. Luke is where is your faith? And I uh, really appreciated, again, Cliff Black's commentary Um, particularly noting, and we talked about this a little bit last week, noting the way in which Mark seems to be doing this Christological reinterpretation of Psalm 107. So we've got got a lot going on here with regard to comparing uh, comparing the versions. John, of course, doesn't have a stilling of the storm because Jesus can't really be bothered with such a thing in John. And uh, so you get you get the three stillings of the storms here, the storm. And then, uh, but I, but the way in which Psalm 107 uh, can come into this and the, and how, again, Mark is drawing on that, you know, that, that promise of God's power uh, and what God is capable of doing uh, with the words of the, of the psalmist, I think, would be a really important homiletical move on the part of preachers this week. After you, um, after hearing your sermon, uh, Caroline, I read something, and as I was preparing for this, I could not find out who said this. But uh, someone was in a conversation, and they were they were asked, um, "How do you describe Jesus?" And people responded with, 
what may be going through our listeners' minds now as, as I pose that question for their imaginations. And then the person responded by saying, relaxed. And the text was the stilling of the storm. And so rather than absent, rather than um, not concerned, it's even in the midst of everything that's going on, Jesus is relaxed. And in the midst of everything that's going on for us, are we able to arrive at, I'm trying to trying to play with that, do you still have no faith? How do we arrive at relaxing in trusting uh, the Jesus who um, is described in, in Psalm 107, the, the trust that is described in Psalm 107 that is on display in this uh, episode um, of, of the stilling of the storm in Mark. To, to see enough faith to be relaxed in the midst of the storm. I have to find out who said that, but that's a different picture for this moment. I think if I were in that circle, I would have said relaxed and. <laughs> okay. Relaxed and. And I mean, he himself is experiencing relaxation asleep, but I think everybody else experiences. I experience him as terrifying in this in this whole thing. So... If you've ever been on a boat or a ship, as I was, that was being tossed uh, hither and fro uh, on 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 the waters, yeah, terrified is that's an understatement. <laughs> yeah, but I would say it's even the you know I think I think in the way the text reads that the solution is more terrifying than the problem. Ooh. The, the way they respond to the to the stealing of the storm. Uh, the line there is they they feared a great fear. Uh, NRSV has what um, something about awe. They were filled with great awe, which I think is a terrible translation. I, I, I think they're I think they're terrified. The um, Kellen, you talked about preparing for this as a preacher and looking at the other gospels. I would read Mary Oliver's poem, maybe also, if you're familiar mm. with that one. Her final line or final two lines of that are that Jesus is um, a thousand times more frightening than the killer storm. Ooh. That there's something about this guy who's asleep when everybody's fighting for their lives. <laughs> and then he wakes up and he just yells shut up to the to the weather <laughs> and then he turns to look at you and says <laughs> why are you so cowardly right you still have no faith um and that's it there's no pats on the back or anything like that or he probably goes right back to sleep <laughs> <laughs> while they're still bailing this thing out so and again, That's how I read it, at least. Yeah, yeah. I I had a a, a, a student uh, preach this text uh, by reminding us, and, and she spent a great deal of time setting up the storm, and and having us, um, you know, sick to our stomach in the the reality of being tossed uh, on the on the waters and waves, but she reminded us what Jesus had done in the scenes before this scene. So this, this particular uh, verse begins, on that day when evening had come, let's go across to the other side. But what had happened before, the healings, the teaching, the awe had already been demonstrated. And... Um, uh, it, it makes that question, um, um, what, it, what does it take for you guys to have faith? And then, yeah, I love it, Matt. You know, <sighs> shut up. And then it happens, and I'm going back to sleep. I love putting it that way because we are left with what would it take for us to relax and trust in God. Well, you mentioned, Joy, yeah, these people fish, some of these people at least fish for a living. Levi's probably just utterly confused because he collects taxes. He's like, I'm an accountant. Why, what am I doing with this guy? 
but the people who fish for a living know when to be frightened on the sea. I, I remember I flew one time, this is like 30 years ago, when I saw a flight attendant look nervous because the turbulence was that bad. And that's when you know, like, all right, the flight attendant's making that face. I'm scared too now. <laughs> right. And so we, it doesn't work just to say these are just weak willed, you know, idiot disciples, right? These are people who know what they're in the midst of. Yeah. I think it's curious too that they call him teacher here. Um, they don't call him by name, they don't call him Lord. Uh, hmm. They call him teacher. And not that I want to reduce this to what will they learn, but but there might be something here in terms of uh, it. What are they going to What are they going to learn about Jesus that uh, that is that is going to be a contributor to faith, or is going to be uh, is going to lead toward trust um, and. And that's where, that's where, you know, have you still no faith? Could it have you still no trust? Um, what is it that they need to learn about Jesus here that is going to move the needle toward, toward trust? Yeah. I, and I think that that might be another direction I would go partic- uh, in, in just what they, what they call Jesus. So it's, it's not that they don't, they they call him that with a certain level of trust, right? In mm-hmm. terms of as something that they need to know, and and Jesus is revealing things to them. But in this moment, what is it that they need to uh, that they need to learn? I love that. Uh, I hadn't paid attention to that, but as you were saying that, Caroline, that's the way that we've divided Mark. That's who Jesus has been in this chapter. He's been the teacher. And it is, according to our divisions, in the earlier chapters that he's been the healer, that he's been the one who has power over our natural world. And um, that that is another way of looking at, you know, our most recent experience of Jesus, of God, should not be um, the totality of our understanding of God. And I'll hold on to that for when we get to Job. Which we could do. Well, I would say, yeah, I would say if, if if these people in the boat have read Job, they know the answer to their question already. Ooh. Which is part of the terror, right? That there's only one being that apparently can control the waters of chaos and can kind of delimit there. And Job's not the only passage. Um, I think Cliff Black has some more listed uh, in here as well. But mm-hmm. um, so maybe it's time to transition to that, right? The part of the terror might be the leading answer to their question <laughs> is, is God or an agent of God who's there in the boat with them. Mm. Did you want to... Uh- Say something about Job, Joy, since you brought Job uh, up. Uh, yeah, it's it's that question in terms of um, uh, when what was the question that the commentator asked? When sudden suffering interrupts ordinary time, how will we testify as clergy to God's goodness? And so the context of that our most recent experience of God, which may be um feel like absence which may feel like um a loss which may feel like um um uh, having been forgotten or forsaken um to remember the fullness of all that God has done that all that all that we we know about God and again in the job scenario even if what you've experienced of God has been trustworthy, has been present, has been powerful, has been good, it's okay to be in the moment where you're going, I don't get this. I, I got questions. And 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 not to beat up on, on ourselves if our immediate experience of God isn't caught up in our in the very questions 
or level of trust that we have at the moment. God's patient to be able to 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 move with us as we are on this journey. Anything from you, Matt, about Job? I mean, I think it's you know the connection is interesting. I mean, the the commentary points it out, uh, but but I think it it what you did, Matt, with connecting the question of the disciples: Who then is this? Right that. Mm-hmm. That that's that's in part what Job Job is wrestling with, uh, you know. Who then is this God? Um, and I and I think also too the the Psalm helps us in that as well. I mean, it uh, in really language that is even uh, even more staggering in many ways mm. um, when it comes to well, God's sheer power and what God can do. That's uh, that's that's where you can say, you know, how do you answer that question? Well, let's go to the psalm, right? Uh, and and we want to have, as you were talking about joy, we want to have uh, certain, yeah, certain expectations of what God what God will do and what God will do and when God will show up and uh, and. And these texts are, they point to the, they point to the, you know, in the ultimate power of God, uh, but that, that power is revealed in God's time, um, which is a really hard about the human condition. The invitation for a, a human to converse with the divine um, that 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 that's what happens here in 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 Job is is this this um I I don't want to defend God here I want to be honest with God which is what I believe Job is doing here in the sense is this is what I know about God so all this that's happening doesn't make sense and then God turns the spotlight on the cosmos and. In some ways, that's that that that's uh, can be an echo of what's happening uh, in the boat. You know, it, it's like you know you've been teaching us all of these great things, Jesus, and now we're in a storm. We said yes to following you. You're the one who said, "Let's go get in the boat and go on the other side." We're following you, and we don't get this. And then this incredible act that our understanding is only God can do, leaves them with the response of Job. Wow. Wow. I, I, I've heard, but now, now I see. Um, and that comes at accepting the invitation um, to come in our doubt, to come in our fear, to come in, in our exasperation. Okay, I've done everything I can. Uh, God, I need you to show up now. And God says, I can be there. Watch. Matt, you were going to say something before I went off on that. Oh, no, it was all good. I was just, I was just something really different that I, I think the commentary by Clint McCann on Psalm 107 is really helpful to, yeah. to talk about the Psalm as a sermon on God's character and, and to help see then its explanation of of a God who protects people at sea as a manifestation of divine hesed or divine loving kindness. And, and so it's interesting then that Mark would kind of choose that Psalm, I think as a kind of a tableau to craft this story perhaps. And if so, then it's, there is something terrifying about Jesus, but there's also an invitation maybe embedded in that story to see him as, as kind, uh, there's a loving kindness there, um, because the question to him, the question they pose to him is very interesting in Mark four, right? It's, teacher, don't you care that we're perishing? Right. In other words, they don't say, uh, you know, they don't say we didn't think this would happen to us. They say like, don't you care about us? <laughs> don't, don't you see what we're doing here? Don't they've already written the end of the story that mm-hmm. they're going to perish and his preservation of them is in some ways a a direct answer to that. I'll show you how much I care, right? That there's a, that it's more than just an attempt or an opportunity for him to show off power and to raise the stakes. Yeah. 
which is, of course, what happens when you're in trouble and you've experienced deliverance, right? You experience that as an act of, of care and kindness. Yeah. yeah. But speaking of loving kindness, For Samuel? David saw. David? <laughs> yeah. So. so this is weird. This is right after the uh, Goliath, David and Goliath story, which, you know, David's going to keep prospering at every, everything he does he's the wonder child it can do no wrong saul is the exact opposite just kind of keeps digging deeper and deeper holes yeah uh but this is also this passage is a reminder that this is a weird book um the narrative's out of sequence in yeah. some ways um like saul doesn't know who david is at the end of chapter 17 but david's already been his armor bearer david's already been playing the lute for him so there's it's this helpful reminder if you're really working through this book, these two books of first and second Samuel, that there are a variety of probably sources and traditions stitched together here, but also a variety of perspectives on David, mm -hmm. which you're going to encounter as the story becomes more and more his. So just to note that I, I think the description of David and Jonathan here and, and in a passage we'll get later on is just beautiful describing their friendship. So those are places you can go. If you want to do more than just talk about, you know, Saul slowly slipping into greater and greater violence and distrust. Um, I don't know if I'd use the word paranoia because that's it's a clinical term, but people, I think, know what I mean, right? There's just, this is what happens when people in power start to not trust anybody around them and think everybody's out to get them. And mm -hmm. it's all act on that. And the echo of this attitude of of uh, of distrusting uh, that is an echo of Cain uh, and Cain's attitude uh, toward his brother Abel. Um, that that this that that to begin to what's the matter with your face is the is the the, the language that uh, one one way of translating how how God addresses Cain. Um, and, you know, it's, th there's this sort of sense of what's going on with Saul that he would be so threatened by David. What was going on with Cain that he would be so threatened by, um, by his brother? And it's what's going on with Cain. It's what's going on with Saul. And I, I think it's important to do that because we can get caught on verse 10, um, an evil spirit from God rushed upon Saul. Um, and I think it's important for us to recognize that it's not, th that what is happening to Saul is not done merely to him from God, that it is already, the seed is already in him. I like the opening line of the of the commentary, because I think it does give us an entry into uh, why why some of these things get narrated. You know, the palace intrigues begin, <laughs> but it's uh, but it's also, I mean, what what's really what's really I think uh, poignant about this about this particular section is uh and the commentary talks about this a little bit in terms of a of a lack of of peace but Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him but had departed from Saul mm -hmm. that is such a heavy phrase uh yeah. and heavy sentence with regard to uh with regard to Saul's recognition of you know david's successes and david's rise to power as a presence of the lord but then simultaneously to be aware of the lord's lack of presence with you and uh and then um and then how that then gets played out in uh but in the palace <laughs> but in our own lives um mm -hmm. and where do we uh, where do we see that kind of dynamic of of recognizing um, recognizing the Lord's presence or not? But that what do we to what do we attribute the Lord's presence? And uh, so, and it's yeah, I just find it to be a very poignant moment. Um, mm -hmm. And 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 that the reaction of 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 Saul is fear, which I find yeah, I find. 
interesting. I'm not sure what I would do with it, but I find it interesting. <laughs> if if to turn on that, I think is a recognition of how out of control we can become when we are driven by fear. You know, there, there's no humility in response to this recognition, which could have been a response. Um, there's, there's just fear. And fear brings out the worst. And that continues to be true today. It, when we are driven by fear, what comes out of us is not humility. It's, it's our worst. I said uh, 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 last week, maybe it was, that um, when we're reading through the stories of Saul and David and, and Samuel, they just, they just are filled with um, the reality of, of our lives today uh, and the question of what happens, uh, as the commentator says, um, due to the failure of God's people to be faithful. Um, um, and the alternative is faithfulness to Yahweh regardless of the outcomes. And clearly Saul, Saul isn't able to do that. Second Corinthians, we keep on keeping on with Second Corinthians. But I, um, <laughs> I mean, just to remind us of what we talked about last week with regard to including uh, going back and including verses eighteen through twenty-one, the end of of chapter five, because we have that move from uh, new creation to uh, to reconciliation. And because um, be reconciled to God is what we get. And then verse 20, and then in chapter six, as we work together with him, um, <clears throat> or as we work together is could be, if, I don't know if the with them is there, that's a variant. But anyway, we urge you also not to accept the grace of God in vain. And so what I really see in this next um, this next section is in part what's at stake in reconciliation or what needs to happen with reconciliation or what are the uh, what are the challenges to reconciliation, but then what are the virtues of reconciliation? And so you see that with you know the the hardships that get uh, that are <clears throat> uh, the obstacles. <laughs> uh, of of ministry and reconciliation, but then what what comes what comes out of reconciliation? That's really what I see um, happening in these verses. I don't know. What do you think? This is the rhetorical apex of the whole first part of the letter, I think, where um, um, Paul's got some problems with the Corinthians. That both sides have been aggrieved at each other. There's all sorts of indications of that early on. And this is a letter where Paul is trying to mend a relationship and he, he does theology first. And this is where I think he's, uh, at least in, um, verses 11 through 13 is where he's extending that olive branch and kind of asking for reconciliation, which gets resumed in chapter seven, verses two through four. So, and, and if people don't know, you should know, um, I know this is outside of the election, but six fourteen through seven one is this notorious problem in Pauline scholarship because it appears to be an insertion. It, it totally breaks the the flow. So if you read from six to six thirteen and then jump to seven two, you'll see him continue this this appeal um, to the to the Corinthians. Which I think is really heartfelt. You know, it can be taken as manipulative because. We think Paul's got so much power, but he's, you know, he's talking about all of these hardships. And what I think he's basically saying is this is how Christian ministry operates. It operates in, in the kind of humiliation that marks the cross and it, it operates in the midst of disappointment and struggle. And so there's no blaming. He doesn't say, you know, you Corinthians are idiots or I was an idiot. You know, it's just kind of, we're in this together, and this is the kind of stuff that Christian ministry regularly encounters. And let's and, amend and, that. And and leaning into how Caroline pointed out that 
this work that we do, it, 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 how does it begin off um, um, not to accept the grace of God um, in vain in the sense of uh, empty, you know, uh, or arrogant uh, in the sense of the grace of God is for me, I'm in. No, as both of you are saying, no, because of the grace of God, we're in this together. And that means that we've got to find a way to reconcile across our differences, across our disagreements, so that we might indeed be the glimpse of the glory of God for those who have not yet seen this, this, this good or this grace. And I think the, the antithesis that end that follow the hardships and the virtues are also important with regard to, like you said, Matt, that this is not Paul uh, shaming, but just, just naming the, naming the, the realities of why reconciliation and forgiveness are so, is, are so hard uh, because we exist in these tensions of uh, that are present in honor and dishonor and ill repute and good repute and the way in which either one of those can, um, depending on where where you locate yourself or where you locate the other, uh, will lead to that division or will lead to that um, lack of reconciliation. And so it 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 narrates in such a way that the reconciliation that is possible be- with mm-hmm. each other because of God in Christ. Uh, is is uh, is hard <laughs> is really hard this is and, and that it's not and i and i think you know the way in which paul is working out of course a theological claim but within the you know the real context of a christian community and somehow has to give language to yes Jesus has died for our, died for us and raised for us, um, but this has real theological, practical consequences uh, for how we live and how we live in community. And so, I think it can become a way for preachers to uh, to maybe not the whole. I wouldn't not the whole sermon, but it, the the way in which what we see in Paul, what we observe in Paul is really theology trying to get practiced. (laughs) Um, And that theology are not just these abstract claims that we make uh, or, or uh, creeds or confessions, but it, where does it actually land on the ground and what difference does it make for a community that is trying to um, trying to follow Jesus? Sermon Brainwave is a production of Luther Seminary's Working Preacher. Working Preacher has been a trusted source of inspiration, interpretation, and imagination for preachers worldwide since 2007. Find episodes and links at workingpreacher.org slash brainwave, and be sure to rate, subscribe, and comment on YouTube. Thanks for joining us.